Well, right, let's get started today. I am excited. We are talking about B2B search optimization and how things are different with uh, generative AI on the scene. As I go, don't forget a uh, couple of housekeeping items. If you have questions, get them in chat while they're fresh. I will either address them live as we talk or we will address them at the end. In both cases, um, uh, just get them out of your head while they're still uh, top of mind so we don't miss out on those juicy questions. Um, the slides will be emailed to you. Don't feel like you need to take screen captures. If you're coming in on, on the live stream and didn't register, you'll have an opportunity to, at the end to request the slides. All you need to do is shoot an email address into a form. Okay, a little bit about me. My name is Steve Robinson. I'm the founder and CEO here at Brilliant Metrics. My background started out in the technical end in the software development space, uh, moved into website, web development, moved into marketing, and that's where I've spent the last 15 or so years. And uh, uh, in addition to leading the team here at Brilliant Metrics, I do some public speaking, I do some teaching. Teaching is my happy place, so I love doing these webinars. A little bit about Brilliant Metrics. Brilliant Metrics is a B2B digital marketing agency focused on manufacturing. Um, our clients come to us because we help them continuously improve. That's in skills, that's in capabilities, that's in technology, that's in knowledge, and obviously it's in results. So if that interests you, please do reach out. Onto the agenda. Today, we're going to be talking about four things. First, we're going to talk about how AI is not some sort of magic silver bullet that is going to make uh, SEO super easy and super cost effective. Um, we'll talk a little bit about second order impacts of AI on uh, consumer behavior. So how are your consumers changing and how do you need to respond when it comes to uh, your, uh, your search engine optimization? We'll talk about SEO content strategy, the types of content that you should be producing in 2024. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can actually end up showing up in some of, this gener some of these generative AI tools. So let's dive in. The first thing I want to talk about is AI is not some magic juice that's going to make uh, SEO super easy. There are a lot of people out there that are thinking really in terms of, of just the first order impact of, of this generative AI, of tools like ChatGPT and Google Bard, and how they make it really easy to do SEO research and really easy to crank out content. But what they're missing is the second order impact. See, there's two sides to this coin. On the one hand, yes, these tools give us a ton of power as marketers. The other half of that, though, is they also give consumers a ton of capability. And so, well, it's really easy to think about, okay, these tools allow us to create content super fast and easy. They allow us to do SEO research at lightning speed with, with crazy accuracy. They're also giving consumers the ability to answer any question without having to visit a website. They're giving consumers the ability to put together you know, everything from a simple project plan to a wedding plan right inside a tool like a chat GPT or a Bard. What's fascinating is when you start combining these two impacts. And so I've got a couple pendulums up here because there's a, in physics, there's, there's something called the, the two pendulum problem. It's really easy to predict the motion of a single pendulum. It goes back and forth very, very predictably. But when you attach one pendulum to another and make their motion dependent on each other, what happens is a path that is actually closer to chaos. Uh, the, the predictability of the position of either pendulum becomes almost impossible because of the way that they interact. And that's what we're about to see with AI. It's not just the marketers and our marketing ability that is going to radically change, but it's also how consumers are going to respond. So first let's talk about AI's impact on competition. When we look at what AI does as marketers, it allows us to create immense amounts of content at scale with very low friction or effort. Is that content necessarily good or valuable? Well, it depends on the inputs and the effort that's put into producing it. But can we produce it at scale? Heck yes. And so what's going to happen is the volume of content on the internet is going to scale, not linearly like it has in the past. It's going to scale more like, well, maybe linearly at, a, at, a, at, a, at an exponential pace. So we're going to see 
more and more and more and more content being produced and published out on the internet every single day, flooding that the the the, the search engines and uh, flooding the internet with with this 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 content. So when in the past you were competing for on any given blog post or piece of content, you were competing for clicks with however many other people that had taken the time and effort to produce a similar piece of content or a piece of content that solved the same search query. In 2024, your competition looks radically different. There are blog post after blog post after blog post popping up on the internet right now, all written by these GPTs. And to get your post to outrank theirs becomes almost prohibitive or becomes a matter of rolling the dice. The other challenge that we face as marketers is consumer behavior as it changes. A lot of those clicks that we would be competing for are just plain gonna go away. Uh, it, when in 2016, when, when Google started uh, integrating their Google answers right into search, marketers freaked out because the volume of clicks dropped significantly and i think somewhere around 17 to 20 percent of of searches didn't result in a click because people could get the answer for very simple questions we're going to see that again only even greater a lot of what what has been people have been going to google to search for they're now going to go to tools like microsoft's copilot or alexa or siri or even within Google, they're going to get the answer right there in what's called the search generative experience that we'll show in a minute. Chat GPT is another area that people are going to. Regardless, they're going to be going to some other tool. They're not going to be going to a search engine. Finally, yes, we have these tools to produce all this content. Yes, we have these tools to do this research, but if you produce content using a GPT and then publish it on the web, there is no guarantee it will rank either today or in the future. There is currently a cat and mouse game going back and forth. There's a tool I invite you to check out called GPT Zero that you can upload or copy and paste your, your content into. And it will tell you with, with some degree of certainty whether or not that content was written by a generative AI tool. You can bet that Google and Bing have similar scans that they're running on every single piece of content that they scan to determine whether or not it was written by a human or an AI. There are some people who argue that Google shouldn't care and won't care if they're meeting the needs of their of of consumers. They're going to they're going to show that content. But they're going to need some way to sift within the millions and, and, and billions of pieces of content that are going to appear on the internet over the course of the next two years to figure out what they do want to show and search. And so you can bet it will be a signal at some point in the future. And so if you're investing in these tools to go and spend a bunch of time trying to go play the volume game, you'll end up losing because a lot of that content won't rank anyway. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about consumer behavior. I'm going to share a video that was re released recently by Microsoft and where they're planning to go. I think they're probably at the front. So Microsoft initially released, um, their mission was to put a PC on every single desk. Now they're looking to put AI on every single desk. And so not only do they have they gone so far as to introduce Copilot as a tool embedded right inside of Windows, but they're going to put a dedicated key on the keyboard. In addition to the Windows key, you're going to have the Copilot key that will bring up that AI assistant. You'll have a partner in the computer that you're working with on every single task. And if you have a partner that you can ask questions to and that it will give you answers to, it's going to be way more accessible than going out to the web to get an answer. The next thing I want to show you is um, something called the search generative experience. Bear with me one moment. I got signed out of Google here. You have to be signed in to get to this, and I can show you how to get to it. But um, bear with me.
This is what happens when you try to close your windows before a webinar. Okay. So in the search generative experience, if somebody is looking for a piece of content, so for instance, um, I'm going to pick on a couple of people I think are on the webinar here. If I want to know how to calculate horsepower from torque and RPM, I can search that here. And instead of it taking me to a website where I can learn how to do that, it just simply gives me the answer right here. Or if I were to search for what is an AMI meter reading, it gives me that answer right here. Those happen to be two of the top search queries for a couple folks on our webinar based on publicly available information on AAHREFs. So you can see with this new experience here, there's no need to click a link. Google isn't even giving you links to click on until down here. So the, 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 the number of people that will be clicking links to visit your website for what are called informational queries is going to drop significantly. Okay. So what does that mean for content strategy? Well, um, there are essentially three types of queries that you can use in search. And we covered this in our last webinar on marketing strategy and how it changed, but I wanna dig a little bit deeper into the, con into the content today. There's informational, where I'm trying to retrieve information from the web. So uh, the example I used, because we recently had to replace our dishwasher is, I'm looking for top dishwasher brands. I'm looking for how to choose a dishwasher. I'm looking for the average price of a dishwasher. I have information I need, and I know it's on some website somewhere. So I'm gonna type into a search engine, a question to get the information that I need. The second type is navigational. This is where I know there's a website out there that I want to get to, and I, I know roughly what it's called, but I can't I can't I don't know the actual web address of it. So I'm going to type the name of the website into the search engine to go get to their website. So if I'm trying to buy a dishwasher, I'm going to search for Best Buy to get to bestbuy.com rather than typing or guessing that Best Buy's website address is www.bestbuy.com. I just type Best Buy into Google and it'll tell me what Best Buy's website address is. I do the same thing for ABT or maybe I'm researching, I want to go read directly off consumer reports. And then finally, you have transactional. This is where I want to do something. Maybe I literally want to buy the dishwasher. And so I could search for, you know, buy insert model number uh, online, or I could search uh, uh, dishwasher repair replace calculator. Maybe I need a tool. And so I'm looking for a, a, a particular piece of software, an online tool or something to accomplish a task. Um, or maybe I'm looking, it's more of a local search. I wanna buy this dishwasher locally here in Milwaukee. Those are transactional types of queries. And pretty much every query that any of us types into a browser, uh, into a search engine is gonna be one of these three types. When we look at the informational queries, these are the ones that are going away. These are the ones that are immediately going to move to these digital assistants, whether it's Copilot built into Windows or it's ChatGPT or whether it is um, uh, Siri or Alexa, which today can't do this sort of stuff, but in the very near future will be powered with AI and be able to respond to this stuff. It looks like Apple is sleeping right now, but this is classic Apple behavior where they watch where other people go while they're working on innovating behind the scenes. And then they come in and, and release something that is a better experience than what everybody else rushed to market. These queries will move away from search and into those tools. And then at that point, you no longer have 
a landing page you're trying to drive traffic to. If the majority of your search traffic is people trying to figure out how to do something or to get an answer to a question, you're going to need to pivot your SEO strategy away from that. The next type is navigational. This is people looking for your brand. These queries should stick around. If I'm looking for a given company, I should get that company's website and I'm going to be looking for that company's website. Now, I might even ask an AI assistant, what is a website for such and such? And it'll give me a link and I'll click it. But regardless, the mechanics of that are going to be the same as they are today as far as making sure that you have a strong brand name, a strong brand presence. This gets into other marketing strategy behind just search about why brand is so important. Because if somebody asks for you by name, they go to your website. But if somebody asks for a category or to solve a problem or to answer a question, they're going to stay inside the AI experience. And then finally, transactional queries. These can't be met yet by the search engines or AI assistants. Um, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of hype about a, a device that was to, that was in uh, uh, at CES this year called Rabbit. And Rabbit is a new operating system that actually works off of transactional AI. So the demo the gay guy the guy gave on stage was he picked up his Rabbit and he said, "Order me an Uber uh, from uh, to get me to the airport." And then it showed him his, his options for an Uber on the screen, and he could either voice into it or select something. And then he said, "No, actually, I need an Uber with six people." that'll carry six people. And it went and redid the, the, the query. And by holding down a button and talking into this device, he was able to do things, not just search things or get answers to questions. He couldn't, the, the, the device was wired up to take action. That is the far future. I think there are, you know, the stuff at CES, some of that never makes it to market. Some of it'll be here in three to five years. But for now in 2024, if you can provide value or utility, that's still going to result in a click. It might be a click inside of a, an AI assistant driven by the, the, the same underpinnings as web search today and the same SEO to strategies as today, or it might be a, um, a click in a, in, a, in a more traditional search engine. But your transactional queries will stick around today. So what does this mean for you? Well, one, focus on that utility. If you have been thinking about releasing a tool that people search see, search out to do something and you have a decent degree of domain authority already, release the tool. 2024 is the year because that's going to be, uh, uh, that's a solid place to invest resources in SEO. Prioritize your transactional keywords. It used to be that we would seek out the problems or the questions that our buyers had on their buyer's journey and build content around that, hoping to snag those people early as they went and searched the web for solutions to their problems. That doesn't work today. If you're going to succeed as consumers move over to these AI tools, you're going to have to go after the transaction itself. So that means... Uh, ranking for your own brand consistently and then make sure that you have pages that also rank for what your consumers, what your audience wants to do. They cannot do things inside of these generative AI tools yet. All they can do is read things or watch things or in some cases make things, but they can't accomplish things. So Focus your effort on your product pages. Focus your effort on your service landing pages where people can actually make purchases and transact business and double down your SEO efforts there. Finally, make sure you have good branded terms. If you have a brand name that is not... Uh, from a vocabulary perspective, distinct. In other words, if your brand name is like your category name, uh, that will cause problems 
in the future. This might be the year to rebrand and create a brand name that is uh, distinguishable from a more generic query. And so for an example of that, if, if I... Um, if I make an, an industrial brushes and the name of my company is industrial brush company, that's not going to work very well in 2024 and beyond. It might be time to introduce a brand that is distinct and will allow the AI bots to understand what's going on um, better and uh, associate that brand name with the category, not confuse it with the category. We'll talk more about that in a second. Actually, that's a good segue. So if I'm industrial brush company, the bots that are reading the reading reading the web aren't going to be able to understand that. When I say these bots, this is what I'm talking about. The way that these generative AIs work is they they rely on a large body of training data. This training data takes the form of hundreds of millions of chunks of text. So that's books. That's up until recently, the New York Times. New York Times fixed that. There's currently suing OpenAI in order to finish fixing that. Um, there is a, a repository called the Common Crawl that has terabytes of web data that have been aggregated or in other parlance, scraped and pulled and are made available to train these models on how to answer questions. And what most people don't know is that when I type a query into one of these models, if I ask chat GPT a question, it doesn't directly answer the question. It just starts typing or talking and then uses a prediction model about what word or words should come next. So it's generating that text as it goes using nothing more than probabilities about what it's read or consumed over here. And so if I ask ChatGPT, what are the top dishwasher brands? All it can do is predict the best response to that based on what other people have written about the top dishwasher brands. It doesn't understand what makes a good dishwasher and therefore what some of these dishwashers have as attributes within them. It just knows what other people have written about, about dishwashers. You can use that to your benefit. There's two things you have to do though. One, you have to improve the association in these AI models minds between a problem that a potential buyer of yours will be researching using these tools and your brand itself. You don't need, in the past, we focused on connecting the problem with the solution. That's not enough because yes, that used to drive traffic. If you talked about the solution to a consumer's problem, they'd end up on your website and the solution maybe would mention you tangentially and then provide a nice solid CTA to move down the, the, the buyer's journey with you. That doesn't work in the context of, a, of an AI. You have to literally say, WidgetCo solves your uh, uh, the common problems plaguing widgets, including blah, 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 and connect those dots. You have to do that over and over again in a variety of venues. The more times these bots run across that text and that copy and that explanation, the more they are going to understand that your brand solves that problem. So when somebody starts exploring that problem in one of these GPTs, it will generate the text that refers back to your brand. A couple of key things you should be doing today to make that happen. One, bot access. When these models uh, first started appearing. Uh, there was a lot of dialogue on the internet, and I haven't seen as much of it lately, but I've seen it here and there about, should you let the bots go scrape all of your valuable content off of your blog? And the answer is yes, because that's the content that talks about your brand. And if that content isn't 
positioning your brand as part of the solution to these problems or in the in the conversation with these problems, it would be worthwhile to go back and edit that content to make sure it does to get back to that and in increasing the association. So yes, you want to let things like the GPT bot, which is what OpenAI now uses, the CC bot, which was that um, uh, that uh, common uh, uh, common core, I think, uh, uh, repository, that's the giant one that a lot of these models use. You want to let those bots scrape your website because if you don't, you lose the opportunity to have your brand mentioned there. But that's not enough. Simply having that repeated over and over again on your website isn't going to be enough to get these bots trained to mention your brand. The next step is going to be some public relations. So, you can do that through a PR distribution of writing some high quality press releases and get them out there through the distribution services. They'll end up getting reprinted and posted in places that the models will then pick up and read. And if those pieces actually associate your brand with a problem or solution, um, a problem or opportunity, I should say, that somebody would be exploring in a GPT, you, you increase the probability that your brand name will show up. Um, but nothing beats bespoke PR outreach of actually crafting a press release, tailoring it to a particular outlet, working those connections and the things that a, a, a true PR professional can do for you. Finally, I'm going to introduce a concept called boilerplate. This is common in public relations, but it's the idea that you have a bit of text that explains exactly what your company does and the problems that it solves. Uh, I believe that this will become a common tactic in the future to make sure that you're repeating that boilerplate anywhere and everywhere a bot possibly could be consuming that text to feed the models. That includes social, that includes uh, your website, your blog posts, your press releases, anything you're releasing should clearly connect um, either a, a sub-brand of yours or a product of yours with a problem or solution or your top level brand and a product or solution over and over and over again. The more you get that messaging out there, the more likely these models will be apt to learn from it. So, to sum up here, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Generative AI stuff is great, but it is not some shortcut to highly targeted SEO. Most of these AI tools have second order impacts, the second pendulum in the consumer response to this and the search engines response to this that are going to cause far more harm to your SEO than your ability to crank out blog post after blog post is going to provide benefit. Focus on utility. Um, focus on transaction and focus on branded terms. Blog posts answering people's questions is not the focus of SEO in 2024. All of that will move in the next two to three years completely away from search and into Copilot and these uh, voice assistants and chat GPT. Instead, focus on your product landing pages, focus on developing tools that will add value that can't be derived from these other uh, uh, assistants and drive traffic that way. Finally, feed the machine. Work to associate your brand name so you can get a brand mention with the problems that you solve and the opportunities that you help your customers capitalize on. Do that through boilerplate text that you make up, show, make show up anywhere and everywhere you can. Do that through press releases and good, solid, traditional PR. Do that through guest posting. Do that through any means you can. And especially make sure that those associations are solid on your website. Because if you have any prayer of showing up, you need to make sure the machines associate your brand with those problems and those opportunities. So with that, um, if you have any questions, please do post them into the chat. And I'm not seeing a ton here, so we may just uh, may just finish up here a little bit early. Otherwise, please do follow us on LinkedIn.
And uh, if you want a copy of these slides, if you did register for the webinar and you got to this through an email link, we will be emailing you the, the slides directly. If not, um, you can fill out this form to make sure that you get it if you're on the stream. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful day and uh, we will uh, see you next month.